Hello and welcome to the Scottish Clans Podcast. I'm Clint. Thanks for joining me today for our discussion about the McPhersons and where they tie in with Clan Hatton and the origins and maybe a little bit more into that. It'll probably be more than one episode series because there's a lot to talk about and I want to keep these short. So that's my goal. That's my goal and we'll see how I do. Because sometimes I say I'm going to keep it short, and then it ends up being 45 minutes long, which I don't consider short, but I'm going to do my best. Before I get too far into talking about the McPhersons, I want to talk about USA Kilts. They make a superior product. I am not a kilt connoisseur. I've never worn kilts from all the different makers, but I have been wearing clothes for a long time, and I know where I'm when I'm wearing something that's of good quality, and my USA Kilts kilt in the McFarland hunting tartan is of very good quality so um, and also you know what was good about them is the customer service they treated me so well so go get your kilt or anything else that you want to wear to display your pride in your heritage from usa kilts at usakilts.com check their youtube channel out they've got awesome content on there i've watched some of it recently so go check them out at the usa kilts and celtic traditions channel on youtube okay so Let's let's talk a little bit about my sources that I'm going to use for for this uh, for this episode. I always feel like that's an important place to start because my information is only as good as my sources that I'm pulling it from, and that is true of pretty much any time you're talking history. So the primary source, when I say the primary, I don't mean like it was a first hand account. I mean it was the the one I'm going to the most because words matter. It's, that's an actual technical term, primary sources in, in history. Um, so the first one is a, a work, an article that I found. I've got a PDF to it. And all these things, I'll try to provide links to you guys for them. But the first one that I'm going to mention is a work, an article that I have in a PDF file by a gentleman named Reynold McPherson. It's called Clan McPherson. 1215 to 1650. Now, this is just one chapter in a, in a, in a, you know, it's an actual book. I don't know if it's an actual hardbound book anywhere. I haven't seen the whole thing. All I have is a PDF on this section of it. But I I think this is really good. It goes way beyond your Wikipedia or standard Scottish clan website where you're going to get just a very brief overview of a clan and use most of that stuff's re- regurgitated, passed around from basically a lot of that ties back to the Collins Scottish clan and fam- family encyclopedia that we've mentioned several times on here. This goes way past that. So I really like this. I recommend to uh, recommend it to you and I would Oh, if I can, I've had these PDFs for a while now, so if I can figure out where the, go back online and find out how I got them, then I'd be happy to provide links for these in the show notes. So go ahead and check the show notes out and see if I did that for you, if you would like to read more on this, because of course there's way more in these articles than I'm going to have time to get to. Another work that I read in preparation for this was a work by Alan G. McPherson, and I think this is, this work is quoted by the first one that I mentioned. Alan McPherson's one is titled An Old Highland Genealogy and the Evolution of a Scottish Clan. And the final one, which is also more of an academic work, is called McPherson Country, Genealogical Identities, Spatial Histories, and the Scottish Diasporic Clanscape by Paul Basu, Department of Anthropology, University of Sussex. All right, so... This you you guys know if you've been if you've been with me for more than one episode you know I love talking about origins. At first, this this everything that I'm going to talk about was originally designed to just be one of those short. Hey, here's five cool things about this clan, and then it involved because I had better sources on this. I was able to dive into it a little deeper, and I just decided I want to talk about this a little more because. Um. The Clan Hatton Confederation of Clans was a major power in the Central and Eastern Highlands. And if you, one reason you should be interested in this, if, even if you're not descended from any of the Clan Hatton clans, the, 
if you have ancestry from anywhere in the vicinity of this part of Scotland, then your ancestors would have been, the history of your ancestry would be very influenced by the history of Clan Hatton. So it's hard to, uh, once again, it, the history doesn't fit into these nice little tiny boxes, region by region, clan by clan. And so if you want to know about anything that has to do with the Central or Eastern Highlands, what I, what I would call the Central and Eastern, Eastern Highlands, then you probably ought to know about Clan Hatton. Now, I might have just mentioned something that might confuse some of you. I talked about Clan Hatton, and I talked about different clans that were a part of it. If, you don't, if you're new to the subject, Clan Hatton... So I'm pronouncing that with a guttural C-H because that's the, I think the, I'm just doing my best. We could go Clan Chatton, Clan Catton. I'm going I'm to stick with the guttural one just because I guess it comes from a, the Gallic. And so um, that's how it would be in Gallic is a guttural C-H. But this is a confederation of clans. It's not one clan. It started off as one clan. And I'm going to talk about that. But it evolved into a confederation of many different clans. Some were originally descended from this kindred known as Catan, Clan Catan. Others married into it and became a part of it. So eventually they were blood part of it, but they weren't part of the original kindred. And then other other parts, other clans that were members of this confederation just joined because it was advantageous to do so. And there wasn't really any lineal connection, genial connection to Clan Catan. Just seemed like a good idea at the time. Hopefully, it worked out well for him. I haven't studied the history of every clan and its relation to, to the broader con, uh, confederation, but that's that's kind of how that's kind of a summary of when we talk about Clan Hatton. Let's talk about so. In my head, it's always the one reason I wanted to approach this episode this way is because in my head for a long time, this is a little cloudy. I knew that the Macintoshes were captains of Clan Hatton. I've even done a an episode. One of my earliest episodes was talking about the feud, the old, old, old feud between the Camerons and the Macintoshes, which involved other elements of Clan Hatton. And I got into a little bit there, and I talked about how the Macintoshes became the captains of Clan Hatton. But how do the McPhersons fit into this, and how do they go from where they started to where they came to be associated with? How does all that work? So that's what I want to get into right now. The the Clan Hatton, when we think about it now, like I was mentioning earlier, we talk about the Central and Eastern Highlands. That's not where the story starts. The story starts in the Western Highlands, in what came to be known as Cameron Territory, in a part in a region of Scotland that's called Loch Haber. Some of you may have heard this term when you're learning about different weapons and you hear about the Loch Haber axe. So this is this is the country where this kindred starts. Now it's interesting because in its origin you have people marrying in with elements that would later become the clan Cameron, which is this all this is ironic because the Camerons as far as I've been able to learn about them, they were actually a confederation of clans too. They weren't just one clan, and they were always called Clan Cameron and forever and ever. No, they uh, they were actually a, a group of kindreds. And this isn't, I, I don't mean to spend a lot of time talking about the Camerons here, just it's its relevant to this time and place as it relates to the Clan Hatton. But the Camerons, the, they had the McSorleys, the... McGillinies and the McMartins of Letter Finley. The McMartins of Letter Finley in the early days of Clan Hatton intermarried with them. And one branch of the, the Hatton Confederation, the original group, was slow to move eastward. And they were the ones, I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that in a little bit. So, yes, Clan Hatton starts in, in an area of Scotland that came to be associated with the Camerons. And the Camerons grew to power in that area largely because this kindred, this network of kindreds, this confederation pushed farther east. Well, let's take it back to the very beginning. In 1215, in the early 1200s, the MacDougals were the dominant clan in this area. And they were establishing a, a uh, priory in 
Ardkatten, or it's called the Ardkatten Priory. Now, the official date on that, if you look at this priory up, of its establishment is 1230. But it was getting going before that, and the McDougals invited and put in position of as the bailey of Ardkatten Priory, a person named, who, who would later be called Gillicatten Moore. Whenever you see that Moore surname, there's a few things that could learn, that could mean, rather. That could mean um, the great, like he was large in stature. It could mean that he was great in, because he was the founder of this line and he was a big deal, so they call him great. Maybe he was a man of extraordinary capability, talent, um, or he, or it could mean senior, um, although that can, there's other ways of saying that. Um, anyway, so I don't, I don't know if he was a big dude or if, because later generations would trace their ancestry back to him because he was the founding member and he's the Bailey of Ardcat and Priory from its earliest days. They call him more, I don't know, but Gillicat and Moore is the, is the first person in the pedigree of the clan Hatton. Now, it's interesting to me, just, just kind of pondering on this a little bit, what was he known by? Because Gile Hatton, Hatton, uh, where we get that name is, that comes from a, a saint from the 600s, Saint Catton. And so, and, and the, where we get the, the CH, it would be the genitive form, so showing possession. So it's the, the heights, Ard, Hatton, of Catton. So it was showing possessions, the heights, whose heights are they? Catton's heights. So you, it's, that's where the H comes from there, and we get the guttural sound. And Gilichatton means the servant, once again, of Catton. So it's showing possession. And the clan, who are they the children of? Catton. So it's genitive. It's showing possession. So we have the H in there again. So all these are usually, we see this in a genitive form, but it's the saint. His original name was Catton or Kahan, I've seen it with a C-A-T-H-A-N, which you usually aspirate that T if there's an H next to it in Gallic. I'm not really sure about all that. I'm not a Gallic expert. I'm just doing my best on what I know. But this priory that was established in his name was established and put in place with its original bailey being Gilly Hatton Moore, and I just wondered what he was called before he became associated with this priory. Anyway, the servant of the great servant of Catton, or the great devotee of Catton, Gila Catton Moore. So that's where we, tr- that's the time period. You'll see other time periods that when you're reading about this that go back to the 1100s, like the 1173 was one date I saw in here, but that would be too early. And so you have the McDougals and you have their close association with this kindred who are probably loyal to them because they were employed by them as the Baileys. Now, Bailey is a not an ecclesiastical role, and I'm not super sharp on all of the old Catholic and the different orders within the Catholic and and all the all the different positions that you could be there. But Bailey was like you're just kind of in charge of the more temporal affairs. Um, maybe even it came to be kind of like a sheriff. Some of you guys who are sharp on all this stuff. But is my point is that it's a secular term. It's a secular role. It's not an ecclesiastical. It's not they weren't clergy. That's my point here. Some of you guys who are super tight on these old positions like this, you can throw in the comments and and contribute here. Um. So he's the progenitor of this kindred, and the kindred becomes known as Clan Hatton because they're associated with him and with this priory, and that's where the name just sticks. Okay. So you have a few generations, like three generations down from Gilichat and Moore. So his great-grandson was named Dermot, and he didn't have any, any heirs. But Dermot had a brother who had accepted a position farther east as the parson. Now, it's an important word. He's the parson of King Usi in Badenoch. So we're moving east, guys. We're moving east up over some terrain, down into the Spey River Valley, or the Strath, Spey, Strath, Strath being a Gallic word for a river valley. And this is where the McPhersons would become associated with. And it, it wasn't their whole ter- territory wasn't in this one river valley, extended over into some other terrain, but this is the territory that would become their, what was associated with them. And how, why, did they, why did they push east? Why do we have this? So this person, the parson of King Usi, his name is Mirich. 
and he gives the name in Gallic. It's, I think it's fascinating that we have in English, and we like, oh, it's the McKenzie's, and it's the McDonald's, and it's the Campbell's, and the uh, so on and so forth. Are these different in the way we always refer to these clans? But in Gallic, they often had a different name, and the McPhersons were one of those who had a different name in Gallic, and it would be referred. They were referred to as the Clan Vurich. Right then, you see again that that genitive form changing the, the sound of the initial consonant. So, the descendants of Murich, who was the parson of King Usi. So, whether the McPhersons are going by the McPherson name or by the Clan Vurich, or or some of the septs would become or the branches of the clan would be known as Clan Vurich or the McVurichs. Either way, you're tracing the name is going back to the same gentleman, Murich, the parson of King Usi. King Usi. I had to look that up on YouTube to make sure I got the right pronunciation. So you have uh, you have this eastward movement. So let's talk about why they are moving east after the wars of independence. So this is a once again, a few generations later after the founder Gilakat and Moore, and we have the war the the first war of independence. And a lot of you know, and some of you don't. So I'll, I'll summarize this that. The McDougals sided with the Cummins. The Cummins, they were loyal to uh, the Balliol. John Balliol, who was chosen as King of Scotland, he would have a son that would later provide more wars of independence. And this story would continue to go with the Balliols, who were originally the ones who, in the succession crisis after Alexander III, became the, the, they were the, the Balliol line was the next king, John Balliol specifically, next king of Scotland. Well, the Cummins were supporters of theirs which made them en- enemies of Robert the Bruce. And you got a lot of you know that there's, a, there's bad blood between the Cummins and Robert the Bruce, especially after um, Robert Bruce stabbed John Cummins and <laughs> killed him in a, in a church, basically murdered him. Well, the problem was the Cummins were, the, the John Cummins and the chief of the McDougals were brothers-in-law. So, you know where the McDougal loyalties lie, and and there I won't go into all the details of this story, the way it fell out, but when Robert the Bruce gained the gained the throne and made good on it, not just crowned because he had a lot of fighting to do after he was crowned, but when he became no kidding King of Scotland, the McDougals fell out of favor. Right, Robert the Bruce grabbed all his friends, went back up there, and took it to the McDougals for the trouble that they'd given him earlier. Okay, so. Who gets all this territory? And so that's where you see the Campbells get a lot of that territory because they were loyal to the Bruce, so to the McDonald's. They were loyal to the Bruce. So they got a bunch of this McDougal territory. Well, if you're this Hatton kindred and you want, maybe want to provide a little distance because you can see the way all this is going between you and the McDougals, um, so you start to distance yourself there. Another thing that um, so the reading went was that Robert the Bruce offered – the this Hatton uh, kindred that they could have whatever territory in Badenoch they could take from the Cummins. The the Badenoch was um, the so the source the the Reynold the Reynold McPherson source the Mac, Clan McPherson twelve fifteen to sixteen fifty that source. I'll just quote a little bit out of it. It says he and he. Robert the Bruce, encouraged other clans to attack the Cummins, especially in their homeland, Badenoch, which I had to look up the pronouncement there. I would have just called it Badenoch, but Badenoch was how I found it on YouTube. So if you could go east and you could physically take territory from the Cummins, um, then you could have it. And, and the Clan Hatton members who were part of this eventually were given legal title by Robert Bruce to the lands that they took in Badenoch from the Cummins. Now, I think it's interesting that we see Badenoch being referred to as the homeland of the Cummins because the Cummins were a very powerful kindred and had territory all over Scotland. They operated on a national level. And so kind of like, kind of like uh, later the Douglases would, but even the Douglases had a, a homeland themselves. The Campbells, the same all these huge, hugely powerful families or clans in Scotland that, but they, they did have a place they were tied most back to. I haven't said the Cummins enough 
to follow and know whether that's a solid argument that that was their homeland, but I do know that they were entrenched there. That was a territory of theirs, and it'd be interesting to be hard, maybe hard to find documented, but their the their kin base in Badenoch. One way or the other, the Mc, McPhersons get in there and they they fight the Cummins. They take it over. Now, here's let me go in a little bit more of the genealogy. And, and unfolded. So you have this clan Hatton that we're referring to this whole time, right? And maybe around the time that maybe this is why Murich finds himself as parson of King Usi's because he's part of this, his kindred gains, gains by force land in this river valley. And, and he gets appointed there because a lot of these ecclesiastical appointments were made by whoever had, had the power in that area. And so we see people who have secular power appointing their guys into ecclesiastical roles. So the clan Hatton, so you have, once once again I said Diarmid was the great-grandson of Gilachatan Moore and his brother Murich. Murich had a son named Ewan Ban. Ewan Ban had three sons who became provided the basically the the general division of clan mcpherson for generations clear up until the 1745 jacobite rebellion this is really interesting so these three sons of Ewan ban the son of murich were kenneth anglicized as kenneth you had john or yoin or ian and you had Gileisa, the servant of Jesus, which is often anglicized as Gilles. So I'm just going to use the English versions of these. So you have the Kenneth, the kindred or Sliacht of Kenneth, the Sliacht of John, and the Sliacht of Gilles. These are the three divisions of the McPherson clan. And they were in these divisions um, actually before the whole movement was made, This whole, the whole transition was made to Betanach. And here's, here's what I'm talking about. Back in the original homeland, uh, by Loch Lochy, on the southeast shore of Loch Lochy, if you look on the clan map today, the one I have, it says McMartin right there. And the McMartins were one of the early, the, the kindreds that made up the clan Cameron later on. The Sliacht Gillies had intermarried with the McMartins of Letter Finley. And so they, and they were the last of these three branches to move east into Badenoch. The, the taking, the continuing, and the, and the wrapping up of the taking of the land from the Cummins was done mostly by those first two Sliachtan, the, the Sliacht Kenneth and the Sliacht uh, John. So... And, and there we see that, that, you know, like me using that term sliach, that actually can go back to the, uh, that earlier episode we had on Gallic terms for the kin Bay society. And, you know, we get wrapped around the axle about, well, were they really a clan because clan's a Gallic term? And then, then we start using words like branches and septs, which aren't Gallic terms, and we get all wrapped around the axle about what we're calling these people when Gallic never used these things, these English terms, and... Anyway, I think it's it's kind of dumb. So I think that's as far as I want to go right now. That's that's kind of an overview of where where the Clan McPherson comes from, their origin, and, and why they move from west to east. To sum it up, so we have established a Clan Hatton, and four or five generations into this, well, four generations into it, we see Murich, and... And we, a couple more generations will probably see people starting to call themselves a descended from him. Now, what about other people who were descended from other lines of the clan Hatton? Well, from, and I don't know how it all fits together, but from these other lines of the clan Hatton, we get the Davidsons and the McFalls, or the McPhails, the sons of Paul. And this is what we refer to as the old clan Hatton. The McPhersons, the Davidsons, and the McPhails. That they are the descendants of this original kin- kindred. Everybody else just joined because it was advantageous or married into this like the Macintoshes did. So I'm actually going to pick this up next time. We're going to talk more about 
how this history continues with the McPhersons and their relation to Clan Hatton. To sum it up, we have the McDougals. Bas the McDougals basically brought this kindred in. Whoever, wherever Gilly Hatton Moore came from, and whatever his name was before he got this, he becomes the Bailey of Ardcatton Priory, and and on the northern shore of Loch Etiv. And then at the wars of Scottish Wars of Independence, a few generations later, this clan Hatton, this kindred that's associated with the Ard Hatton Priory, um, they're wanting to maybe distance a little bit from the McDougals, and they get offered to take land in Badenoch by Robert the Bruce. So they're starting to push east, okay? And they don't do it all at one time, but eventually they they came to be associated with Badenoch at the expense of the Cummins. Um. And they're taking their name from Murich, the great-grandson of Gaelic Hatton Moore, who was the parson of King Usi. And so whether you, they're going by the Clan, Clan Vurich name or the McPherson name, it, they're taking that from the same person. And that's how they get in, established in Badenoch, and that's where they would become associated with. So I hope this is interesting for you. I hope it was educational for you. This is how they connect back in with Clan Hatton. Next time, maybe we'll flesh out a little bit more of Clan Hatton and talk about the McPherson's relationship to them. And let me just get one final shout out to my sponsor, USA Kilts. Guys, I, I don't have anything negative to say about my experience with them. I just don't, I can't, I don't have, I love my kilt. I love wearing my kilt. And I'm not just talking to the guys when we talk about buying kilts. I mean, any, because that's typically a male garment and I'm not creating any hard rules for anybody out there, but it just seems like it's more of a male conversation. But anything you want to find that can express your pride in your Celtic or specifically Scottish heritage, <coughs> excuse me, we can uh, you can go to usakilts.com and you can find good like superior quality good kind of sounds like eh, superior quality products to show your your pride in your heritage and and great customer service free shipping in the US all sorts of good reasons to go there to get your attire for this specific desire to to express that that pride in your heritage also for just some good content, some entertainment, some education, go to their YouTube channel at USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions. They've got stuff about, like recently I, I watched one on people wearing kilts to prom, and that's something I'd never thought about was, well, what about the skiing do? You know, like that can get you maybe in a little trouble trying to pack a knife into your prom. I don't know. They talked about that. I'd never thought about it. So they'll, they'll you'll learn stuff you didn't think about. So go Go to their YouTube channel, at USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions, guys. I have a, uh, I have a Scottish Clans a website at scottishclans.podbean.com. Go there, and I, it's still a work in progress, but I do have a. I'm getting a pretty well developed sources page on there, so go check it out. Um, go, I've got links to PDFs on there. I've got academia.edu links out there. I've got affiliate links. If you want to buy hard copies from Amazon, you can go get... I, if you're kind of like me, I just kind of like to have a an actual book in my hand when I'm reading stuff. So if you want to buy something from Amazon, I've got some affiliate links on there. Also, um, can I get a, just a quick shout out? Not the, I'm not sponsored. I'm not any way financially connected with these guys. They're just other guys on YouTube that are putting out some great comment and they've given me shout, shouts out on their some of their episodes and I really appreciate it. And like, I watch their stuff and I'm not there's I just, cause I think it's interesting. It's just, this is just a completely pure shout out to Mike over at clans and dynasties and Philip on Irish medieval history. And they often collaborate and do episodes together, but they don't only do that. They do their own stuff too. And then also Bruce Fumi on Scotland history tours go look at look, go look him up he's got he's and that's more like general scottish history uh sometimes he overlaps with clan stuff he just he's just a good storyteller so go check him out um mike and philip they get real academic if you want to like do some some no kidding um scholastic type getting into it and a lot of their stuff covers especially philip on irish medieval history he covers more ireland but i'm interested in that too mike on clans and dynasties he does do scottish stuff on there so go check him out if you want to 
get in contact with me, you can do that through the Podbean, scottishclans.podbean.com, or you can go leave me a, a review on Apple Podcasts. Of course, it would be a five star. And give me a written feedback on there. And then I have a thriving uh, Facebook group on there just called Scottish Clans. So search it up. And, and until next time, Marsh and Leib and Drasta.